Good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. We're continuing our series, The Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. And this week's great exchange goes like this. God wants to exchange your small living for a much bigger calling. Uh, it's part two of our, of our sermon, Rebuilding and Renewal. And this week we're looking at Queen Esther, a small book in the Old Testament called Esther. Uh, it, it's named after Queen Esther. And we're talking about God's purpose for which you were created. Let me ask you, what are you living for? You see, the story goes like this. God has an offer today. He wants to exchange maybe your small living for a much greater calling. The, the, the big phrase in the Bible, the big famous phrase in, in this story today is, for such a time as this, you have been created. It's what Uncle Mordecai said to his niece, Queen Esther. He said to the queen, who knows, for such, as, for such a time as this, perhaps this is why you were created to make your mark. Let's talk about the story. We can't read the entire book today, um, but, but the, the, the book of Esther, uh, the, the central characters are, number one, the Jews who were dispersed or displaced uh, they'd been pulled out of Jerusalem, pulled out of Israel, their homeland, and they were slaves throughout the Persian Empire, about a thousand miles away from home. And then we have all the other inhabitants of the Persian Empire. We have King Xerxes, we have Queen Esther, and her uncle Mordecai. And then we have another uh, national figure, a political figure named Haman. So we have King Mordecai, I'm sorry, we have Uncle Mordecai and Haman, who are actually arch enemies, even though they both live in the Persian Empire. Uncle Mordecai is a Jew and Haman is, is Persian. The backdrop is the kingdom of Persia, of course, and uh, chosen to replace the banished queen, queen is Esther, the new queen, Esther. She is made queen without her nationality being made known. She's Jewish. Soon she finds herself and her countrymen, the other Jews in Persia, they're in danger of losing their lives to a bizarre plot. The danger arises at the hands of evil Haman, the arch nemesis of Uncle Mordecai. They were, Uncle Mordecai, Haman, they were like the yin and yang of the kingdom. Both had been promoted to places of honor by the king, um, Mordecai, a Jew, and the uncle of Queen Esther, and, and Haman, on the other hand, a, a Persian. Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman as the king had decreed in this unusual decree that you can read about if you go back and read the entire book of, of, of Esther. And so because Mordecai is unwilling to bow down to Haman, Haman loses his mind with anger. Haman, knowing that Mordecai is a Jew, decides that Mordecai and all the Jews, all of his countrymen, countrymen in the entire kingdom of Persia must die. False charges, a really large financial bribe, and, and Haman tricks the king into giving permission to undertake ethnic cleansing. Kill every Jew in the land. He even set the date, March 7th, about one year from now, he said, we will kill every Jew. Now remember, the king, King Xerxes, he doesn't know that his queen is Jewish. And so Queen Esther is faced with a life and death situation. Should she reveal her nationality and risk being banished even executed? Would she protect her life and watch as her countrymen die? The day had been set, March 7th. Uh, that was the day. It was still several months down the road. So she had quite a few months to, to consider, to think it over, to pray. And ultimately, in the story, she does the right thing. And God is on her side. And the, and the annual celebration, the festival of Purim, is still celebrated to this day in honor of God's deliverance of the Jewish people in the kingdom of Persia. 
Okay, what I want to camp out on today are the famous words that Uncle Mordecai spoke when he was trying to convince Esther to do the right thing, to, to do something about this tragedy that was set to place, that was set to take place on March 7th. And he uses the words, I've already quoted them, for such a time as this. Queen Esther, for such a time as this you were created. Now those words were actually Mordecai's rebuke of his niece. They weren't meant necessarily to be encouraging words. They were words of rebuke uh, of his niece for her self-serving, safe mindset. She was queen with all of the comforts and all the perks of being queen and, and did not want to risk losing her fame, losing her fortune, losing her safe, comfortable status. And it's as though Mordecai is saying to his young niece, you are so chiflada. You've been chosen to put aside your self-interest. This is the day for you to lay aside your pampered, comfortable lifestyle, the all about you mentality. It's all coming to an end now. You have been chosen to put aside all of your self-interest, young queen, set aside all of your self-ambition and take on a higher calling, a risky, tiring, messy deliverance of your countrymen. Who knows, Queen Esther, perhaps you were born for such a day as this to walk away from your self-interested motivation and live for a greater cause. Let's read Esther chapter 4, verse 13. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Famous words. Then Esther sent this reply to her uncle, to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Pray for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, uh, night or day. My maids and I will do the same, and then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Okay, so, so that's what happens. Ultimately, Esther goes and tells King, Morde uh, king Xerxes what, what evil Haman is doing, and, and, and it all actually turns out well. March 7th goes like this. First, King Haman uh, has, uh, sorry, King Xerxes has Haman executed. Um, uh, but, but the king could not rescind the decree that allowed non-Jews to systematically kill every Jew on March 7th. That was the decree, and there was something weird about their laws that did not allow him to rescind these irrevocable decrees. So March 7th is going to happen. Non-Jews have permission to kill Jews in the kingdom of Persia on that day. So here's the king's solution. He would issue a second decree. On March 7th, the Jews living in the kingdom of, Jer of, of Persia were permitted to defend themselves by any means necessary against any attacker with no recourse, no fear of punishment. It sounds like the purge, doesn't it? Like the non-Jews had permission to kill the Jews, but the Jews also had permission with force, even deadly force, to defend themselves, and it works out. Esther 9 goes like this. So on March 7th, the two decrees of the king were put into effect. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the king's provinces to attack anyone who tried to harm them. 
But no one could make a stand against them, for everyone was afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the highest officers, the governors, and the royal officials helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai. For Mordecai had been promoted in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. Okay, here's the big idea. It was true in Queen Esther's life. It's true in our lives. In God's plan, plan for your life, my friend, I speak Mordecai's words over you. For such a time as this, June 2021, Deep South Texas, Cameron County, Brownsville, Texas, for such a time as this, you have been created. Oh, dear friend, your, your existence isn't random, and it isn't for your sake alone. You're created for something big, something great. You were created for a battle. You're created to build a kingdom, but not your own kingdom. See, see, this is where people who do not follow Christ, who, who, who do not fear the Lord, they, they find no purpose in life because we were made for a bigger purpose than just my little existence. Many of you here today, you're building your own kingdom. Fact is, God is calling you to abandon that puny endeavor and enter a new battle, a dangerous calling, a cosmic mission to build God's kingdom. Some of you today, at the hearing of this message, you're going to abandon the vanity of merely living for your own kingdom, and you're going to answer a higher calling, a greater calling. Second Chronicles 16 says this, The eyes of the Lord, they're scanning the earth. They're looking. It says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God, God calls in this story Esther to trade in several things, another, another exchange, to, to trade in royalty for righteousness. He calls her to trade in selfies for service, vanity for valor. This may be your ticket, friends. If you're finding life to be especially boring, or maybe you feel some guilt that you just feel like you're, you're, you're just wasting your life, just spinning your wheels, just not sure where you're headed, just kind of making money and coming home every night tired and, and you, 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 you're drugged up on dopamine and, and, and you're like, what is life really about? Now, the thing about living a life of, of vanity you know, it usually, it usually includes words like, well, what is my destiny? What is my purpose? The odd thing about living a life of honor, living a life for the Lord, is it also includes those exact same words. Calling, destiny, purpose. It's something every one of us want. We want to know, what's my calling? What's my destiny? What's my purpose? So, so, so a, a life spent chasing vanity and a life spent in living in honor, they, 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 both, they both are born out of this desire to make something of my life. But, but for some, it just leads, leads to a life of vanity and others, a life of purpose. So how do I know if I'm living a life of vanity or a life of purpose? It's pretty simple. The question is this, for whose kingdom are you living? Whose kingdom are you building? Your own or are you building the kingdom of God? Which will it be? Vanity or valor? What is my destiny? It can be a very selfish question if I am living a very self-centered life. But, but what is my destiny can be a, a very purposeful, very honorable question if we're building something bigger than ourselves. For such a time is this. It was actually a call for Queen Esther to, 
to break out of this myopic, self-centered mindset that was solely focused on her own well-being. The Lord has a calling on your life, in your current job. You don't have to get a new job to, to find your purpose in life. In your current job, the, the Lord has a purpose. In your, in your current neighborhood, in your current marriage, in your current social setting with your current friends, the Lord has a purpose. The Lord doesn't need for you to quit your job, become a pastor, become a priest. No, in fact, like Esther, he is giving you the position that you have in life for such a time as this. He made her queen for that very purpose. He, he has placed you wherever he has placed you in what, whatever position he has placed you in for such a time as this. Not so you can get rich and prepare for retirement. Rather, to save a lost people here in Cameron County, here in Brownsville, and to restore the kingdom of God here on earth. I mean, that's what River Church is about. That's what we want to see happen. We want to see this city saved and, and people come to a saving faith in Jesus. And the Lord says to you today, for such a time as this, those are words that God speaks over you. He speaks over me as well. He didn't place you and me uh, where we are so we can just be divas, post our entire lives on social media, pay off the house, take vacations, retire early, vanity. No, 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 we are in the middle of a cosmic battle, a, a, a war, not a culture war, that's just a distraction. Not, not a political war, Again, just a, a distraction. We are in the midst of God building his kingdom, pushing back the darkness in Brownsville, filling the darkest places in Brownsville with light. A great man, a pastor, Dr. Tony Evans, he said this, quote, to miss a kingdom assignment because we've become too caught up in our personal kingdom is one of the greatest tragedies we could face. Now, think on this. How many lives right here in Brownsville could be blessed because we choose to step up, to serve, even though it's going to mean sacrifice, even though it's going to be hard, even though it's going to cost me something? Will you make a sacrifice? Will you join in the battle as God builds his kingdom right here in the RGV? God's going to do his work here in Brownsville. Oh, that he might work through River Church. What a tragedy if he, he works in spite of us. But I believe over the next 18 months, he's going to be working right here through us. Would you join in? Would you take up the sword, would you take up the mantle? Would you, would you join us as we see God build his kingdom here in Brownsville? So, so let's pray. Let's, what, what does God have in store for you going forward this year? I've said that we're, we're in the beginning of a new era, I believe it, for, for, for River Church, uh, uh, this, this post-COVID uh, rebuilding, uh, new start, post-COVID, let's, let's go for it and, and see what God might do here at River Church in the next, in eight, next 18 months, a window of opportunity. That's what we're entering into here at River Church. How about you? How might you be a part of that? Dear friends, I want to close out today with a very personal invitation. Listen, I understand the frustration in life, the sense of I go to work, I, I make money to get ahead, I, I work out at the gym or out of doors to, to build up the dopamine, the drug that I need to make it through the day. I go to bed and I, I do it again tomorrow and I'm living for my own kingdom, but it just doesn't feel like there's much at the end of the road. I want to invite you to a higher calling. In Ephesians chapter 6, 
we're told that, 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 that the battle that we're engaged in is not just a battle of flesh and blood. In other words, you may feel like, you know, you got enemies. Maybe the enemy is poverty or maybe the, the enemy is your, uh, somebody at work or, or maybe the, the, the enemy is your next door neighbor and we're fighting a very small battle because we think that's the battle that we've been called to. And Ephesians 6 says that, no, we're, we're, we're invited into a much greater battle battle. It says that your battle is not against flesh and blood. No, it's a spiritual battle. That's the battle that the Lord has undertaken to, to push back the darkness here in the valley and to establish his kingdom, the kingdom of God, right here in the RGV. And so the Lord invites you into a greater, more valiant sort of calling, sort of battle. And so what does that look like for you? Well, it looks like this. The Lord has placed you right where you are on purpose. If you want to be a part of his, his greater plan, the way that he is, he is his, his building his kingdom here on earth is really through the church. And so I invite you to, to, to get involved. And there are four ways, four simple words that I invite you to consider. Four simple words, four simple invitations. First is an invitation to pray. Get on your knees and pray. Pray for River Church. Pray and say, God, I want to I engage in a, in a greater, a more valiant sort of battle, a more honorable calling. What do you have for me? What do you have for me specifically here at River Church? Pray. Pray that River Church might gain some real traction over the, eight, the next 18 months and that we might actually make a difference here in the RGV. Pray. Pray for the church. Pray for your involvement. The second word, the second invitation is an invitation to serve. So many needs here as we rebuild post-COVID. So many ways that you can engage. So many ways that you can serve with our kids, with our adults, with our youth, in the service, during the week. How might you serve? The, the, the third invitation is an invitation to give. What we are going to do over the next 18 months is going to cost money. River Church continues to minister to the community because of your good gifts. Don't stop giving. Those of you that aren't giving, the Lord invites you to, to test him. Be a generous person. Be a generous person toward the church and see if God might actually reward you, might bless you in that process. The word tells us that he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And then the fourth invitation is an invitation to invite what I'm saying is, who are you going to invite? Who are you going to bring along with you to River Church that we might see this, this, this movement, this ministry expand? The Lord says that when we look out at the harvest, meaning the, the, the lost in the valley that, that need the saving grace of God in their lives, that when we look out, the first thing we're to do is to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more laborers. So who are you going to invite? Who are you going to pray for? God, would you bring more people to River Church? And I want to be a part of that. I'm going to invite my friends to River Church. The invitation today is to pray and to serve and to give and to invite. Won't you join us? Be a part of something bigger than yourself. I think it will bring for you a deeper level of satisfaction than you're currently experiencing. I love you. I want the best for you. I miss seeing you. I, I look forward to seeing you again in person real soon. Have a great day.